what if? What if we could do what we love to fight what we hate? What if we could use our passions, our skills, our interests, what makes us unique to fight some of the greatest global issues facing our world today? Three years ago, my career trajectory took a dramatic shift and fairly unexpected one. I had been in the corporate world and, and had really planned my trajectory and strategized how I was going to work through to, to get to where I wanted to go on the corporate front. I got my dream degree from Oxford University. I worked with an ambassador. I got to travel and be a part of some peace negotiations on some of the highest profile conflicts of our time. I had worked with some of the largest corporations in the world. And I thought I had my plan figured out, but something changed in my heart that made me take a huge shift. I left the corporate world and started working for a nonprofit. And I quickly realized something that I didn't expect. I realized as I was trying to build this small nonprofit that I had served on the board for and had been involved as a volunteer and suddenly was in this position of leadership. And I was trying to mobilize volunteers. I had worked with some startup companies and was used to bootstrapping things. And I was trying to figure out how do I equip people to help us build this organization to rescue women and children out of sexual slavery and exploitation. I started having a really hard time. I realized that it was incredibly difficult to find volunteers who were willing to give their time in the area of their skill set, the area of their passion, and the area of their natural giftings. I was trying to figure out what it, what it was. Was it just me? What, what, was I doing something wrong? Why was it so hard to find people who were willing to give time in the areas of their natural gift sets? Now, I'm not saying it was difficult to find volunteers, because I could find people to hand out name tags at annual dinners or to come and stuff envelopes with newsletters from time to time. But finding professionals to use their skills and use their passions and use their interests was extremely difficult. I started this soul-searching process and started reflecting on my journey because my journey into the nonprofit world was a little bit backwards. I kind of backed into it because I started volunteering and started serving and it kept taking me deeper. And so I looked at my last corporate job, the last job I had before I left into the nonprofit world. And I had been working with uh, a global PR and communications company, one of the top companies in the world that does PR, media, communication, strategy, and consulting. And this company really wants to make a positive impact in the world, so they actually give their employees paid time off strictly for volunteer. So you can't use those for your own vacation. You can't use them for anything else other than volunteering. You get paid time to leave and go volunteer. Now, a lot of the employees didn't use those, and I I started thinking back on that because at the time I was serving on this board and was helping some nonprofits with their business plan and some branding strategy. And I was thinking, okay, well, wasn't everybody doing that? And as I was reflecting on the email strings that would go around and, and the, the notes that would say, you know, your, your time's going to expire. If you don't use it by the end of the year, you don't get, you know, you're going to lose those volunteer days. Take that time. And the company was reminding employees, don't forget to volunteer. But then I also started thinking about email chains that went around, about employees that were organizing trips to go to the animal shelter to walk dogs together for a half day, or employees that were going to the homeless shelter to serve food. And I started thinking, you know, that's interesting because while those activities are important and we need those, here we were working for one of the top media consulting firms in the world, writing press releases and writing media strategy documents for some of the biggest companies. And yet, when the bulk of us were going to nonprofits, we never did any of those activities. Nonprofits who would be desperate to have some of the best media minds thinking, how do we get your message out to your people better? How do we reach new demographics? How do we tell this story better? And yet, when they go, they go and walk dogs. And again, it's not that there's anything wrong with walking dogs. You would just think that maybe a portion of that time would be used to do the very thing that the, the companies across the world are longing for them to do. I started looking back more on my experience, and I traced it back to this moment in my life in 2008. I took my first trip to India in 2008. Normal guy, normal tourist, didn't have any particularly noble objectives for the trip, but I met this amazing Indian man that was a humanitarian and had for 20 years been rescuing women and children out of brothels. He invited me to come see the work, and he picked me up and took me into the largest red light district in the world. At one time, there's debate now which one is the largest, but at one time, Kamadapura was said to be one of, if not the largest, red light districts in the world. And as we drove towards this red light area, I had no paradigm. I didn't even know what human trafficking was at the time. As we approached, I could see the sea of taxis, as far as the eye could see, leaving the area, packed full with these young women. I was told that these women were being taken to the hotels in the area. 
and I began to brace myself for something that I couldn't even wrap my head around. As we got into the heart of the area, you could see the long, dark alleyways and young girls lining the streets and, and bars and cages in the windows with lifeless eyes peering out and men just disappearing down these long, dark alleyways. Thousands of women and children being exploited in this area. They told me that they had rescued girls from those very streets and then they dropped me off at my hotel and I sat there trying to process what I had encountered. It was entirely overwhelming. The next morning, they, they picked us up and said that we were going to see the other side of the work. So they, they picked us up and they drove us an hour outside the city. And as we approached this home, they told us that this was a safe house for children under the age of 12 who were all HIV positive or who were needing some type of specialized medical care. All children that had come out of that very red light district. As I walked towards this place, I realized I was bracing myself for something sterile, almost medical, institutional, kind of some, some type of somber, whitewashed place where kids whose souls had been ripped out of their bodies by torment that I could not even imagine were sent to spend the rest of their days. I braced myself for what I thought would be depressing and overwhelming. And when I walked in, it was exactly the opposite. These kids came running and they were singing and they were full of joy and they grabbed my hands and they wanted to teach me the Indian version of patty cake and they wanted to show me their bedrooms. And they grabbed my hands and they said, come see where we sleep. And in contrast to where I had just been a few hours the night before, these kids wanting to show me their bedrooms felt awkward. I felt uncomfortable. I, I, I thought, okay, I, 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 I don't... I don't I don't know if I, I'm okay with this, what, and, and these kids are just dragging me, and so I, I go along, and the kids walk, and they each want to show me their bed. They say, look, look, this is where I sleep, and they smile and point at their bed. And, it, and I realized in that moment that this place that had once been a, a symbol of torment and fear and darkness was now this place of safety and security, this place that was their own sort of sovereign territory that never had to be shared, that never had to be unsafe again, and they were so excited for the world to know that they had a bed. That night, I was on a plane back to Seattle. I sat on the plane trying to process, and when I came back, I felt like I had to do something. I had to do something to help those kids, and I had no idea what it would be. A few months later, I was preparing to, to go on a climb and climb Mount Rainier, which is the most glaciated peak in the lower 48. It's the tallest mountain in Washington State. And I was going with a group of friends, and we didn't have any particularly noble objective. We did it because we like to climb. We have fun climbing. It's our hobby. We spend time together doing it. But 14 days before the climb, I got an email from a friend who was doing a, a marathon to raise money for medical research. And I had this moment where I'm like, well, I've been trying to figure out what I could do to help those kids. And if you can run a marathon for medical research, why can't you climb a mountain for kids in slavery? challenge was we only had 14 days to do it. Um, I pitched the idea to my friends and they said, why not? Let's try it. Let's see what we can do. So we, we decided we would try to raise $14,410, $1 for every vertical foot of the mountain in 14 days. And again, we had no idea if this crazy concept would work. And I wish I could say that we had planned it out. You know, we, we decided to climb this mountain for these kids and we had this huge noble objective. Again, we were going to do it anyway because that's what we love to do. But we threw this campaign together. We decided to put a name on it and call it Climb for Captives. We climbed this mountain, and we ended up raising over $20,000. And we were totally shocked. We couldn't believe that this thing worked. And people started asking us, okay, well, can we be a part of it? Can we do that? And so more people wanted to climb. And so we kind of just kept doing it because we like it. We like climbing. We're going to do it anyway, if I'm honest. We were going to climb, so why not do it for a cause? And so it kept growing, and, and eventually it brought in a quarter million dollars. And we were funding scholarships for some of the kids that I had met. And we were helping them go to college and pursue their dreams. And I couldn't believe it. I was getting to do something I loved. I was climbing mountains. And so then I started getting more involved. I wanted to learn more about the issue. And people started asking us to come and speak about it. And can you tell us about human trafficking and educate us? So I had to, to learn more. And so then I started meeting these nonprofits and found out they need help with business stuff and with media strategy. And I just did it because it was right in front of me. And they asked me to help. I never really set out to say, okay, well, what am I good at? And what's my 10-step strategy to utilize it? But something else amazing started happening. Other people started using things that they were naturally good at, and some you wouldn't expect. In fact, one guy decided 
that he was capable of growing a really big, somewhat nasty beard. At least his wife thought it was nasty. And so they decided that he was going to raise money to grow it, she was going to raise money to shave it, and whoever won got to decide the fate of the beard. And they raised thousands of dollars. And then somebody else heard about it and said, well, I can't grow facial hair, and I definitely am not climbing a mountain, but I can do dinner. And so they started doing five-course dinners by donation at their home, and people started coming and donating and engaging their community, and it kept growing and growing. People have done bike rides. People have done marathons. People have done all kinds of things to utilize their passions, to utilize the things that they're naturally good at. And we started feeling like maybe we were onto something. But what was interesting is people still seemed to be shocked. They thought this was so revolutionary. When they would hear stories of beards and dinner and climbs, it was like they were just overwhelmed that they had never thought of it. It's like, wow, that's, well, what can I do? And that was always our question of like, but, but I don't know, what can you do? Like, what are you good at? I, you know, and a lot of people in the nonprofit world, they come to us and say, well, okay, apart from giving, what can I do? And they usually want a list of, you know, email your congressman or, you know, come do, volunteer at these three things. And what I always want to say is, you tell me. Like, what can you do? What, what do you do? What are you good at? What are your passions? Well, and what's interesting is that we're not alone. We're not the only ones struggling with this. There's some really interesting data. So according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics, part of the Department of Labor, about 25.3% of Americans volunteer. So I'll leave that up to you if that's a good number, a poor number, a mediocre number, but one out of four of us as Americans are going to volunteer. Now where this gets really interesting is in the data underneath that. And actually the government has thought it was interesting enough to study it. And so the Corporation for National and Community Service, again another federal agency, decided to do some studies on it. And they published a report and their number one key finding at the top of the report in big bold letters, most volunteers do not perform service activities that relate to their professional or occupational skills. Bummer. <laughs> right? Like 25% of Americans are volunteering, and then after that, most of them don't even do what they're good at. So that means they're doing, so they're doing something. Here's an example. If we look at professionals in arts, design, entertainment, and media who volunteer, so these are the people in those fields who are volunteering, who are actually going and volunteering, and we look at those people, this is what it means. 79.3% of them who are volunteering will never use those skills. Now, this was relevant for me because this was an area that I had some experience, and one of the areas where I was scratching my head thinking, okay, why isn't this happening? 80%, 8 out of 10 that go volunteer. If 10 people go volunteer, 8 out of 10 of them will never use their skills. Now let's imagine that. It's a bit like having a five-star chef come to your house to help you prepare for a dinner party, and then you give them the vacuum cleaner. Right? And it's not that there's anything wrong with vacuuming. In fact, vacuuming might need to get done, but you'd think you'd at least have them prepare a few appetizers first. Right? Like 80% of these people never do. And if we, if we go and look at the next layer, about 9.3 of them will occasionally do it. So we're getting warmer. They'll say, okay, well, I'll, I'll dabble in my skills a little bit. I'll, I'll do that. I'll help you with that one off. But I'm going to spend most of my time over here. And about 11.4% of them primarily use their skills. So only 10%, one out of 10 people out there that are volunteering are primarily using the things that they're naturally good at. Now, in all fairness, I think the nonprofit community has to take some responsibility here. It's not just because individuals aren't out there being proactive. It's that the nonprofit world honestly doesn't know what to do with it. When we started this whole climb and cause thing, we actually had a hard time finding nonprofits to partner with initially because they were thinking, well, wait, what? Like, no, we have, the, here, here's our list of like the 10 things you can do because they get that question. What can we do? Oh, here's the 10 things. And we're thinking, well, no, we don't want to do those. We want to go climb a mountain and raise money for you. And they're like, well, we don't. We've never done that. We don't climb mountains. We're like, no, no, you don't get the point. You don't have to do anything. We will just tell us how to like, get money to you. <laughs> like, so I, want, I, I don't want to, I don't want to put all the blame on the average American volunteer who's not using their skills because I think the nonprofit world has to share in that blame. But as I looked at this data, I started again thinking, okay, how do we change this? And what was it within me? And I, again, looked back on that experience. And, and for me, I can trace a lot of what drove me to one moment. See, there was a point several years ago when I was in a safe house 
in India, and I met this young 15-year-old girl, and she wanted to practice her English, so she was talking to me as much as she could and engaging me as much as she could because she wanted to practice her English because she had big dreams, and English, knowing English, was going to open doors for her. As I prepared to leave, she came and said, I'm graduating from high school in three years, and I need you to promise me that before I graduate from high school, you'll come back and see me. Because when I graduate, I'm going to pursue my dreams, and I'm going to go to college, and I'm going to leave here to go to college so that I can pursue my dreams. So you have to come back at least one more time and see me again, because after I'm gone, we may never see each other. And I had made a promise to those kids and to myself that I would never, ever commit to something that I couldn't 100% guarantee I could keep. Because these kids had had way too many broken dreams, way too many broken promises, and I didn't want to be another layer of disappointment. I wanted so bad to promise her, but I didn't know. I didn't know if my plane would drop into the ocean on the way home, what would happen when I came back, when I would have the next opportunity to go. And so I looked at her and said, I can't promise you that. I will try, I'll do my best, but I can't promise that I'll be able to come back. She looked at the floor disappointed, and then she looked up at me and said, oh, I know. Do you promise that you'll remember me? That statement hit me like a ton of bricks because here's a girl whose mother died on the streets outside of the brothel, and she was abandoned. She was rescued in the nick of time, has no living family members on the planet, and nobody outside of that safe house that knows she exists. And she just wanted to know that somebody out there would remember her, that there was a lifeline, somebody out there that would fight for her, that would remember her, that knew she existed. And I promised her in that moment that I would never forget. And at the end of the day, the reason I fumbled into all of this, the reason I backed into starting to, to use my passions, to climb mountains, to volunteer with the things I was naturally good at was not because of some great strategy, not because of some great plan, but because it was the only thing that I knew to show her that I would never forget her, to fight for her and girls like her. And until we feel deeply connected to the causes that we're passionate about, the causes we care about, and the people that are affected by those causes, until we feel like we have the power to do something, I don't know that we'll be motivated to use the core of who we are, the best of who we are. And so what I'm here to do today is to challenge you. What makes you unique is the thing the world needs the most. The world needs the best of who you are. That the causes are too urgent to give anything less than that. And that there is incredible opportunity to do what you love, to fight what you hate, because real people with real issues need to be remembered.